What's up everybody, it's Matt here again from Filter Grade and today I'm going to be going over how to shoot 16mm film with the K3 or the Krasnogorsk 3. I have a video about this from a couple of years ago now but I rewatched it and I wasn't really um, too keen on it. I don't think I'd actually shot that much footage before I had made that video. It was more of like, hey check out this test roll type of thing. But now that I've been shooting for a couple of years, I want to show you how to do it first off because I think a lot of people are super intimidated by it and they think it's like a super expensive um, B just really scary and like almost like impossible but just watch this if you're interested in learning about film or if you've never shot film before or really yeah if you're just trying to get started and see what it's all about because for me that was where I was at when I first started and yeah I watched a couple of videos and I was like oh wow I could do this too so this is me telling you you can easily do it um, just follow these steps and you'll figure out how to so let's get started the first thing that you're gonna need to do is actually you know get your hands on a camera whether you're renting or buying um, that is up to you. You can find them on eBay, you can find people that sell them on Instagram, you can probably find them on some random niche Facebook niche marketplaces. You can find them all over the place. I got the Krasnogorsk 3 because it seemed the most similar to the Super 8 cameras that I was shooting before that were more like, um, you know, handheld like trigger cameras like this. So that's what I was looking for. I know a lot of people go for Bolex cameras um, and there's tons of others. Just look on eBay. I can link the link in the description for um, Max K3 camera. He's this guy in Russia that restores and refurbishes and builds these cameras to be kind of like modernized and all different types of variations and stuff. He's a super great guy. That's where I got this from, and it's been good for me for the past four or five years. So you can find them from him. I think he also has a page on eBay or. There's other people that you can buy from on eBay, which I'll kind of like flash through so you can see what that looks like. There's some that are super expensive. There's some that are a little bit more affordable. Um, and then some of them will come with a lens. Others, you'll have to buy the lens separately. For me, mine originally came with a, the, like the standard lens that this had on was like a 17 to 70 millimeter lens or something. Um, so you can really use it for like everything. I really enjoyed that and then I started shooting a little bit of more music videos and things like that with it. So I needed something that was a little bit wider. So now I have this, um, I think it's like a 14 millimeter lens. It's a Belomo fisheye lens, so maybe eight millimeter, I don't even know, but it goes all the way down to 3.5 and it does the job really well. So. The first, yeah, the first step is just going to be finding yourself a camera. I highly recommend the Krasnogorsk 3. It is really great and it's also good for beginners that don't really get film all that too well. So the next step once you actually have the camera itself is to find some film. So today I have Kodak 500T. This is a tungsten speed or a tungsten film, which means it's balanced to tungsten light, not daylight. There's all different types of film from 250D to 100D, 500T, I think they might make 500D, I don't know. But there's a few different variations, I'll link them all in the description. You can also kind of just search for like 16 millimeter film at B&H or online on Amazon or anywhere else you might be looking for it and it'll kind of show you the different types. The number is just like the ISO, so 250D would be 250 daylight balanced film. Um, 500T is 500 ISO tungsten balance. They also have black and white film and I'm sure they, if you look hard enough they probably have some like special effects red film or, or things like that. Um, but yeah my camera right now has 250D in it and I also have a pack of 500T which I don't know that I'll be shooting because we're outside right now but yeah that's the next step is finding actually like what you're going to be shooting. All right, so the next step is actually gonna be loading your camera. So this is gonna be a little bit different depending on what camera you're actually using. For the K3, it's relatively simple. I've only loaded a few other 16 millimeter cameras. They all kind of have a similar mechanism um, and system. So it's not too, too difficult. It just takes some practice and you're gonna to wanna to practice maybe using 
old film uh, just to make sure you know how to, you know, wind it all correctly and, and get it on the spools. This was something I definitely struggled with at first. I even remember there was a couple times when I was on set using the camera that I actually reached out to Max on Instagram because I couldn't get it to be 100% perfect. I remember one time it was like uh, midnight. I was in Boston and it was midnight here. I'm not even sure what time it was for him, but he immediately responded to my question on Instagram and then even called me back like right away. So that was really nice. He helped me load the camera perfectly and get it all set up and whatnot, even with the language barrier. So that was super convenient. And if you have any questions or need to figure out exactly how to load the K3, check out our other video on that. And that'll go more in depth on how to actually load the camera. Just like any other camera, you're gonna wanna get to know it before you actually start using it. So let's go ahead and just look at some of the different knobs and dials that you're going to need to know before you actually start shooting with it. The first, obviously on the lens you're going to see your aperture and you're going to see your focus ring. Um, that's pretty standard. Next up you're going to see the frames per second dial. On here you can shoot anywhere from you know stop motion like one frame per second at a time to 60 frames per second and I haven't really done too many experiments using you know 60 frames slow motion footage with this camera but I have shot in 24 frames per second 18 and even 12 if I want to get sped up footage or, or something similar to that nature so that's always a fun way to experiment normally I'm just setting it to 24 and the next is going to be the actual crank knob this is what's going to Kind of wind up your camera to shoot there's no battery in this camera so the more you wind the more footage you're actually going to shoot if you only wind one or two turns you're only going to get a little bit something else to consider when shooting with this camera is the exposure settings um there's no light meter built in so you're going to kind of have to think about your exposure and get to know it a little bit more it's not as easy as just shooting with a digital camera seeing what looks nice seeing what doesn't look nice so for me i use a light meter app it's free i found it on the app store it wasn't too much research done you can go ahead and buy you know an expensive light meter if you want to that's fine for me i just always have my phone in my pocket so i figured i would use this and it's really easy to use i just open up the app once it's ready to go um, I set the shutter speed to 1 60th of a second. That's what my camera's automatically set to if the frames per second is at 24 frames per second. Right now, I have 500 speed film in, so I'm gonna set the ISO to 500 and then point it at my desired frame and whatever it tells me to set the aperture to, that's what will be an even light setting. Obviously, you have some leeway on either side. If you want it to be a bit darker, you can expose for that. If you want to be a little bit lighter, you can also expose for that. So just keep that in mind when you're shooting. Okay, so you just finished your roll. Now the last step is just going to be to get it processed, which at first I had no idea how, where, like I had no idea about any of that and didn't really understand it. So I remember when I was younger, I looked on Reddit, like, how do I get my film developed or where do I get my film developed and things like that. Um, when I lived in Boston, it was a little bit trickier because there weren't really any labs in the city. I used to ship my film out to CineLab, which is in a different part of Massachusetts, or to Color Lab, which is in Maryland. I highly recommend Color Lab. They were really good and they were always pretty quick about the turnaround times, which was something I used to get really annoyed about. Um, when having to ship it in the mail, but that's a story for another day. So for me now, I live in New York, so I go to Negative Land. Um, they process Super 8, 16 millimeter film, probably like 35 millimeter motion picture film. They they uh, they develop and process a lot of motion picture film. They're really good at it, and it's actually really nice being able to go in person and talk to them a little bit about you know what you might want with your footage or with your film and whatnot so it's really cool to go in and like see it in person um so if you're in new york i highly recommend going to negative land if 
you're not in New York, I still recommend shipping your film to Negative Land because they have really good pricing and they get the job done really well. Um, but so yeah, so the main thing is that once you get your film out of the camera, you're gonna wanna keep it in the original canister that you had the film come in. The reason being is because these are light, light proof containers um, that are sealed at all the edges and whatnot. So don't risk exposing your film by storing it in like some paper wrapped something like you know just do it properly store it in one of the boxes that you got your film in and it'll just make your life a whole lot easier um but yeah really besides the developing and scanning um there's not too much else to it i think something to think about a little bit down the road maybe once you have your roles ready to develop are what format you're going to want them in um and how you're going to want them put on your computer, I guess. I know a lot of labs, you can either ship a hard drive or bring the hard drive to them, or you can upload that, you can have the lab upload them to Google Drive or Dropbox or have them WeTransfer transfer it. Sometimes that costs money because some of the file sizes can be a bit larger depending on how you're scanning your film. Um, normally, for personal projects, I will scan in either 2K or 4K. And for most of my like work projects, those ones I'll scan in 4K just to have higher quality. And most of the time I'm shooting digitally in 4K, so it kind of just matches up easier. Um, and then there's a few other things to think about, like what format you want them. I usually go for Apple ProRes format. If you have a Windows computer, you might want something different. Some labs don't really even give you that option. They just send it off. Um, and then something else to think about is if you want the actual film gate um, on the border or if you don't want that. I know a lot of people don't really like it. Other people think it's the coolest thing ever. I'll let you make that decision, but that's another thing to think about. And yeah, besides that, the developing and scanning portion isn't all that much effort. I guess it just costs money and it takes a little bit of time, but on your end, you should be fine. So if you have any questions, make sure you talk to the people at your lab. They should be happy to help. But yeah, other than that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about shooting film, developing, editing, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment or reach out to me on Instagram. Um, I'm always more than happy to help. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoy your day. I hope you enjoyed the video and peace out. Have a good one.